Hello everyone, uh, welcome uh, to at least in the UK this afternoon session, uh, Brexit and beyond global and local challenges in the UK overseas territories. Uh, my name is Peter Clegg, uh, I'm uh, Associate Professor in Politics at the University of the West of England in Bristol in the UK and I'll be uh, moderating today's session. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speakers today, I just want to set the scene a little bit um, before we go uh, into the specific presentations. Uh, it does seem a long time ago, but back in June 2016, the UK voted to leave the EU. Uh, at the time, there was very little understanding prior to the referendum of the implications of the UK's departure. Understanding has increased, at least up to a point, but it won't be until the start of 2021 that we'll begin to see the impacts of Brexit after the transition period. As we were putting this panel together, we thought uh, that the Brexit issue was fading from view, particularly in the shadow of COVID-19. But it has roared back to centre stage and again poses questions as to the approach of the British government. One of the issues that was little discussed prior to the referendum and has only occasionally punctuated the discourse since has been the impact on the, overseas, the UK overseas territories, most of which had a strong relationship with the European Union. Gibraltar as a member of the EU, the others as overseas countries and territories. And significant benefits accrued from this relationship. For example, there were non-reciprocal free access to the EU market, bilateral and regionally focused aid in relation to infrastructure, the environment and budgetary support, the free movement of uh, OT citizens across the European Union, and a significant policy dialogue whereby territory politicians and officials could link directly with the European Commission and the European Parliament in Brussels. And all that has gone. So what comes next? A factor that underpins these discussions is resilience. Uh, what can the territories do to safeguard their position and how vulnerabilities can be mitigated? So we have Benito, Andre and Teslin providing important insights into their territories, with Kate helping to provide that broader context in relation to small island living and the challenges that are apparent. Uh, so each speaker has about uh, seven minutes, uh, so that takes us to about half an hour, and then we have a good hour for hopefully some engaging and interactive discussion and debate about the issues raised in the presentations and anything else you want to bring in as well. Uh, so without much further ado, may I introduce you to Benito Weekly, our first speaker, who is the Special Envoy for the British Virgin Islands Government. Benito. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Peter, let me first thank you and the organizers at Island Innovation for the very kind invitation to sit on this panel. I should mention that I'm also a policy fellow at the University of Cambridge, where I've examined uh, these issues in detail. The overseas territories are a special group of islands and coastal communities whose circumstances are indeed worthy of our attention. I'm glad that the public today has a chance to hear a bit about our challenges and to engage on any issues of interest. This discussion is very timely as negotiations between the UK and EU on a future relationship have come to an impasse, which has created more uncertainty for everyone involved, including the overseas territories. At this stage, the downside of Brexit for the overseas territories is more or less well understood, as you've said, Peter. We already know development cooperation with the EU will wind down and come to an end. We also know there will be non no non-reciprocal trade arrangements, even if the UK and EU strike a free trade deal. And of course, the UK will not have the political influence it once enjoyed as an EU member state, which allowed it to advance the interests of the overseas territories. A lot stands to be lost, and the big questions or whether the UK will fill the gap and what the post-Brexit relationship between the UK and the overseas territories will be. The EU has been a vital source of development assistance, particularly for those overseas territories not eligible for aid elsewhere. EU funds are supporting the sustainable development of these islands in key areas such as climate change, biodiversity and sustainable energy. Future rounds of these funds will not be available to the overseas territories. The UK has also not committed to replacing these funds after existing projects and programs end. Funding priorities for the overseas territories are currently being considered in the UK government spending review. We shall see what comes out of it, 
but I have serious doubts given the fiscal and public health challenges posed by COVID-19 and the overseas territories ongoing need for support in this area. In regard to future trade with the EU, whatever terms the UK and the EU agree will also apply to the overseas territories. If a free trade agreement does not materialize, it simply means trade with the EU will be on WTO terms. This will impose higher costs on businesses and customers on all sides. I hope this can be avoided. At the global level, COVID-19 has struck a severe blow to the UK's international trade ambitions as trade activity everywhere has slowed down. While the government has offered to include the overseas territories in any future trade agreements upon their request, there's a long way to go before the UK secures new trade deals with other major economies. The overseas territories in the Caribbean may be able to get around this through participation in regional trade arrangements, but others are not in the same position. Another economic issue for the overseas territories is the powerful influence of the EU on the global financial system. In, re in recent years, there has been an unease between the EU and overseas territories on the issue of taxation. On this front, the overseas territories that host international finance centers have engaged with the EU as third country jurisdictions. For obvious reasons, it has not been very convenient for the UK to openly advocate for them on such a sensitive issue for the EU. Beyond Brexit, there's the question of what type of partnership the overseas territories will have with the UK. In recent years, the relationship has been strained. Admittedly, this has, has been mostly with the overseas territories in the Caribbean and North Atlantic. The UK has become increasingly heavy handed in the handling of certain things. Just recently in the Cayman Islands, for example, a vote in the legislature by the democratically elected representatives was overruled by the governor on the instructions of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. No opportunity was afforded to Cayman to pursue alternatives. This was a blatant disregard for democracy where the rule of law could have been allowed to take its course or other options pursued. The ends did not justify the means. Also back in 2018, the UK made the decision to disregard the constitutions of the overseas territories by imposing on them a requirement to adopt public registers of beneficial ownership, despite existing arrangements already in place that provided the UK with this information. These jurisdictions were also compliant with international standards set by the Financial Action Task Force. Constitutionally overreaching into devolved areas of government that are well managed by the overseas territories just for political purposes, tramples on their constitutions and the rights of their people under the UN Charter. It is colonial. So a new constitutional settlement and policy direction for the overseas territories and UK is needed in which they can effectively work together as partners in a world of uncertainty, new challenges and emerging opportunities. One critical area for cooperation that I want to highlight is climate change. As islands and coastal communities, the overseas territories are very vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change, such as extreme weather events and sea level rise. In the Caribbean, we are in the middle of a very active hurricane season and annually face the risk of being hit. You will recall that the British Virgin Islands was devastated in 2017 by two Category 5 hurricanes and floods. Building climate resilience is the key to coping with these challenges in the near term until global warming is arrested. One of the barriers to achieving this is funding. Like most other small islands, the overseas territories need external funding support. However, most remain ineligible for the pots of international money out there for this purpose. The UK can greatly assist by working with international partners to adjust the existing criteria to allow the overseas territories to qualify for these international funds to help build climate resilience. The UK can also directly replace the EU funds for climate change adaptation that will be lost to the overseas territories in future rounds of EU assistance. This is a very important, important issue for the British Virgin Islands. After Hurricanes Irma and Maria, the BVI received no official development assistance from international donors to rebuild, and the decision was made by the UK government not to provide monies from the UK Treasury for reconstruction that could boost climate resilience. Rather, we were steered towards loans that have not materialized. Small islands are not net CO2 emitters. The major polluters should financially assist them to recover and adapt from climate change related natural disasters. The UK and overseas territories have an opportunity to partner in this area 
and demonstrate at the COP26 climate talks in Scotland in 2021 how small islands and big states can, big states can work together to achieve climate resilience. And with that, Peter, I will end my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Benito. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we'll leave the questions to, to the end of the speakers, but there's a lot of material which I'm sure will provoke some discussion later on. So thank you, Benito. Uh, next, uh, Andre Ebanks, head of the Cayman Islands Government Office in the UK. Andre. Uh, good afternoon to you, Peter, and good day to the listening audience on virtual platform. It's an honor and privilege to speak on behalf of the Cayman Islands, so thank you very much. Before getting into the substantive discussion, I thought I'd say a quick word about Cayman because I didn't want to presume that the entire audience knew exactly even where Cayman is. So with a strong seafaring tradition and a pioneering spirit, three small islands, Grand Cayman, Cayman Brac, and Little Cayman, in a few decades, just being one hour flight south of Miami, transformed into a modern, vibrant financial services and tourism sector and destination and achieved relatively significant market share and, and due in no small part to our well-developed infrastructure, modern technology, sound law and order, and a Cayman kind culture that grew the population pre, pre the pandemic to about 70,000, but about almost 130 nationalities. So a really strong community with a deep branch of high world-class professionals in, in a wide range of specialist areas. So going on to the topic, I, there's been two minds about this discussion all week long. And there's probably a hundred rabbit holes you could go down talking about Brexit. So I kind of thought to myself, how could I convey on behalf of KMAD in about seven minutes, an illustration of how with, with, with the support of Britain to recalibrate the relationships, not only with the EU, as the question asked in the wider world and Britain itself. And it didn't really all come together for me until the, la the prior panel for this conference, which was entitled Islands Response to, COVID, to the COVID Pandemic. And I think as an illustration of the COVID response, at least from, from Cayman's perspective, encapsulates the essence of the opportunity that I really think lies ahead. So where I, from where I sit in London, I witness an extraordinary partnership between Cayman, our sister OTs, and the UK in response to COVID. And I want to take a moment to go a little bit deeper than just the headlines of the PPE that was delivered, the test kits, the evacuation flights, to really draw out the human element that came about. So during the lockdown, particularly between late March and June, what was on full public view for Caymanians and Cayman residents to see was a highly coordinated, caring, careful, hands-on melt all barriers approach between the UK and Cayman to get things done and preserve life. And due to that fact, I feel that certain bonds of trust and fellowship have been established that won't soon be forgotten. And I believe that in that spirit, it helped and probably brought about a statement by our governor, His Excellency Martin Roper made a local Cayman press briefing on the 25th of August, so just last month. And I believe it was profound and worth repeating, so I'm gonna just read out the entire quote. As the UK hosts COP26 next year in Glasgow, a pivotal moment in the world's response to climate change, I'm talking to the Premier and Minister Seymour, which is our environmental minister, about developing a closer Cayman UK compact, setting out where we can cooperate. This once in a century health crisis is a once in a century opportunity to reshape the world our children will inherit. Cayman should be a part of that. We shouldn't waste it. And what I extrapolate from that is no matter what form Brexit takes, if the UK, Cayman and the OTs get together and strive towards collective prosperity, I believe we have strong prospects. So the overall, the overarching opportunity that Brexit and environmental action presents in the midst of COVID is to harness the bonds forged through, through this pandemic to build a meaning way forward of what exactly Global Britain means and what it means we are as a family. And a few early seeds have been planted in Cayman. I mentioned COP26 and working in partnership with the UK to agree achievable environmental 
priorities and identify some of the funding streams that my colleague uh, Benito and fellow panelists mentioned a few moments ago. Exploring ways in which the London financial services industry can work closely with Cayman's financial services industry through organizations such as City of London Corporation and others. And perhaps for Cayman, developing a niche area in which we may be one of the domiciles of choice for environmental social governance investment vehicles. Climate actions are going to cost money. Cayman has mastered putting together well-regulated investment funding vehicles and getting them to market efficiently. That could be our global, one of our global contributions to green and blue finance efforts. Consideration and explore whether or not the Paris Agreement should be extended to the EOT should be in contemplation. And on a domestic front in closing, Cayman took the COVID lockdown period to do some think time and created a strategic economic advisory council to explore a variety of initiatives in terms of advancing renewable energy, diversing our, our data services, fostering digital, digital payments. So I suppose what I'm saying is, yes, you could look around and see that the, the forecast looks stormy, but I believe that through this pandemic, there are rays of light that we should capture on and really make Global Britain mean something. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Andre. That's great. Uh, so now we move away from the Caribbean uh, to the Falkland Islands. Uh, and next we have the Honourable Teslin Barkman, MLA, and members of the Falkland Islands government. Teslin. Thank you, Peter. Um, so as my colleagues um, from around the overseas territories, Benito and Andre, have, have pointed to, we're talking to a dramatic swift change in the modern relationship with the EU and also to an extent the UK. Um, when I came onto the assembly in 2017, uh, we were still working to understand the, the full and longer term impacts of Brexit that did have a very specific as well as a general impact upon the Falkland Islands economy. So since 2017, we've commissioned a series of in-depth reports that look at understanding some of these impacts in a bit more detail. As a result, the department trade again is our headline. There are also um, the same the same environmental funding concerns that are shared across the overseas territories in being able to replicate the funding pots of BEST and LIFE that the EU biodiversity funds um, are made, currently made available. So in a given year, over 50% of our gross domestic product can be linked to our EU relationship. This is in our fishery and agriculture sectors, but also in the industries that service those key sectors of our economy. As a small nation, we're also heavily dependent upon public services. So our government has a distorting, a distorting uh, large amount of money that we put into providing a large and broad amount of public services for a relatively tiny population of three and a half thousand people. Importantly, we built our fishery sector after the war in 1982 and in the late 80s we were able to build upon the UK's relationship with the EU through a system called the Overseas Association Decision. So this gave the overseas territories market access, single market access into the EU as well as into the UK through that relationship. So something we continue to do is invest in, those, invest in that relationship and all of our Falkland Islands fishing companies our joint ventures with Spain. There is an, a, a really close relationship that we've maintained over 30 years. And as a result, the destination for over 90% of our fishery products and a third of our meat exports is the EU. And it all goes through Galicia in Spain. These are kind of huge figures. But if we're looking at a no deal Brexit, which was for a long time what we were really hoping wouldn't be what the UK and EU were able to negotiate between themselves. Um, the World Trade Organization trade tariffs puts about six and 18% tariff upon those fishery products that we trade. 
And these are huge figures for us, but I do appreciate that we are a small population. What is really quite interesting, which was brought about, which was kind of identified as a result of some of this in-depth work, is that it's actually a huge deal to the EU as well. So our calamari product, which is completely not competitive with the UK industry's fishing products, about a third of the EU imports are from the Falkland Islands in that product. So if you're having a, a lovely um, dinner in, in northern Spain or in Italy, uh, enjoying some lovely calamari, there's a one in three chance it came from the Falkland Islands. Now, that EU relationship is key. We were able to build and establish such a long-term and profitable and, again, market-dominant presence within the EU as a result of it, because it was also not exposed to the same level of risk that trying to negotiate other markets around the world has, has been a challenge for the islands. So Argentina, for example, cannot actively lobby against that EU relationship that the UK had because it was that network that supported and one that we were then able to access. So we also have a logistical barrier in terms of being so isolated in the South Atlantic and not being able to dip into the same level of economies of scale of, of elsewhere. The Caribbean network, for example, you have got uh, close, closer and more friendly neighbours than we do in order to be able to help to develop the Euro economy resilience, for example. We do not have that same level of benefit with quite an aggressive neighbour next door to us. So it was a real opportunity that we could sell our premium fishery product at a premium price. And obviously the, impact, the potential impact of tariffs upon that is gonna be significant across the economy. Falkland Islands companies also invest in multi-million pound vessels. So we support over 6,000 jobs in Galicia as well, through shipbuilding and also through our fisheries activities. Despite this mutual benefit, no arrangement on Falkland Islands trade has been struck. The UK fishing industry conversation, as I said, is completely separate to ours, but we were relying on the fact that the UK and EU could negotiate a, a trade framework that we could then try to replicate in a similar way as the OAD gave us a link into the EU single market. But what does this mean to our for our future? We continue to lobby alongside the UK government to try to highlight these particular issues. But we're also looking, as Benito has indicated already, to see how the overseas territories can create a meaningful link into future free trade arrangements that the UK can secure. And of course, as everyone's recognised, we're in a whole new world. We are reassessing the impact that Brexit is having, as well as looking at the different market demand fluctuations that COVID-19 is causing with a tourism sector that is receding and then recovering and then receding again and a recession on the horizon that is of global scale. The market demand for, for these products anyway is being affected and we need to understand and fully uh, be able to communicate that risk to the UK government on top of the present risk that we currently understand. And what does that mean? Yes, we need a modern relationship. And gratefully, the UK has arranged free trade arrangements with the OTs. This was kind of expected, but it's, it's still a good thing that we've negotiated to be able to trade into the UK without tariffs. But unfortunately, it doesn't address our main problem. We still need to find a destination for over 90% of our products in a beneficial way. So we'll continue to work with industry and with the UK government to try to highlight that issue. Um, on the environmental issue, which is again wide ranging and one that all OTs are hoping to lean into, you've got 94% of the biodiversity of the UK in its overseas territories. And if you don't recognise and respect and encourage that, there is a huge deficit going to be left in the, in, for future generations in the UK. We all want to lean into the next COP and certainly it's something that the Falkland Islands is wishing to prioritise. We have a unique relationship with our environment. We promote habitats and also run extractive natural resources industries. The two don't seem on, the, on face value to complement each other, but actually we invest so much in our fishery science 
and in our environmental protection and environmental assessment, uh, we've been able to establish one of the, oh, sorry, the most significant say whale populations in the very place where we are uh, actively um, running our maritime sector through. So we have a, a really great story to tell. Falklands does, as do other OTs, in terms of biodiversity and climate change mitigation. I think we all want to see it better linked up in the future. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Teslin. That's great. Thank you. So, so far, the themes of sort of resilience and, and attempts to mitigate vulnerability are very strong. So, and that, that may take us to, to Kate Matheson, who's a good colleague of mine at the University of the West of England. She's going to talk a bit about her research and actually our research, uh, looking at uh, small islands, but closer to the British mainland. Kate. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you, everybody. It's been great to um, hear everyone's different contributions. Mine's going to be slightly different from a slightly different angle. Um, as I'm not an islander other than being British, um, rather I've done research on islands, as Peter said. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about the research um, that we've done, the remit of our project and the islands that we've looked at um, and their vulnerabilities specifically around um, identity and how that's going to be impacted by Brexit. So our project was internally funded through UWE, um, initially building on Peter's work um, on small island governance. And I was recruited as a research associate in 2018 to work with him and another colleague on a piece of research looking at the psychological impact of living on very small islands and ways to make small island communities more sustainable um, in terms of their kind of viability as communities in the long term. So it's been a pretty wide ranging project, um, looking at different aspects of the island lived experience, including environment, uh, population change, tourism and employment, governance and island identity. Um, and although we didn't specifically look at Brexit in the research that we did, the challenges that it poses will impact on everything that we did cover, um, as I'll come on to, to discuss. So our field work was based on two different islands proximate to the British mainland. Um, in order to protect the anonymity of our participants, we've taken the step of anonymizing the islands that we visited. And we've written about this in a paper submitted to Roundtable. Um, I know this is quite different from a lot of island studies work, uh, which typically advocates for the islands where people um, study. But we felt it was justified for a number of reasons, kind of symptomatic to a number of island issues um, around a small population, limited employment opportunities and the nature of bounded communities. Um, but to give you some context, um, the islands we visited are off the coast of England, um, rather than being overseas territories. And it's really interesting to hear the kind of comparative um, perspectives on that. They have small populations and economies uh, predominantly centred on tourism and farming. Um, and without, it kind of sounds a bit patronising, but I use the expression our islands or our islanders um, to try and preserve the anonymity when I talk about them without being too kind of clunky in my terminology. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. We found that, like many islands, um, our islands were subject to multiple challenges and vulnerabilities and that Brexit was just one of those, um, and often not the most prominent one for the people that we spoke with. Many of the issues are not unique to the islands we visited and I know are shared by a lot of different communities, um, particularly island communities. Um, so that might include pressures on housing stock, um, as more housing is used for tourism and less available for families, alongside pressures on building new housing stock. Um, it also might include challenges around employment and the brain drain seeing young people leave for um, higher education and often not returning, but also the kind of comparative problem of professionals not being able to do a kind of full job and having to hold multiple roles um, to constitute a kind of full time employment. Um, and then also we particularly looked at challenges of access to healthcare, um, which has been made additionally complicated by the ongoing um, COVID situation and additionally relevant as well. Um, so thinking about Brexit, while it might not have come up as a challenge in itself when we interviewed, um, it certainly impacts on a lot of these different concerns. And as with aspects of island living, um, the challenges that Brexit poses for the mainland UK are likely to be heightened um, in the island context. So if we look at the food system, for example, and it was really interesting hearing Teslin talk about um, their kind of food systems and the way that ties in across Europe. Um, but looking at that kind of specifically on the small islands, we looked at costs of food are already higher um, on islands because of transport costs. But once Brexit price rises are factored in, um, particularly with fuel costs rising as well, that will have a double or kind of triple impact um, on the islands that we looked at. So 
obviously there's a lot of these kind of challenges but one of the ways we found of islanders overcoming um, their island challenges was through the development of a distinct island identity um, so using social identity theory which we took from social psychology um, which addresses how people form identities in group situations we looked at how islanders form strong senses of identity based on their island experience so this can be formed in a variety of ways um, so for example you might be you might define yourself as an islander as distinct from a mainlander or in the case of people living on archipelagos um, as distinct from the other islands and then from the mainland as well this happens at various levels of abstraction and bridges across identity categories so that residents of different islands might feel more affinity with residents of other islands even when they're not proximate um, than they do with nearer mainlanders and this kind of conference is very much kind of testament to that isn't it it was also really interesting to see who got to decide who the true islanders were um, and the patterns of birthright and long-standing residents in the community that determined that um, nevertheless it wasn't just being born an islander some islanders were made not just born and people did seem to share a really distinct identity and we found that island identity is often typified by notions of resilience um, which are related to the stringencies of island existence um, and to the precariousness of the elements um, so this all results in, a, um, in an aspect of making do that may, means that residents are well prepared and better able perhaps than mainlanders or certainly they consider themselves to be um, to withstand certain stringencies and challenges. Um, people talk to us for example about how they have generators and dried food stores in case islands are cut off by storms, um, the ways in which building materials are repurposed because of the cost and difficulty of finding new materials and different ways people find of filling their time in the absence of the mainland attractions. So as well as being based on resilience, for a number of people we spoke to, their identity as an islander tied in with being European. Um, and in that respect, Brexit represents a challenge um, to their identity there in a, in a way, in a kind of existential way rather than a practical way. Um, but this wasn't necessarily the norm. So in addition, there's a sense of antipathy towards the mainland and to mainlanders, um, which in some instances also underpins island identity. Um, and this differs very much in different island contexts. So Scottish islands, for example, might find um, their residents with a sense of antipathy to the government in Westminster, whereas for English islands, um, it might be much more focused on Brussels. This antipathy can be both in practical terms of a resentment of what's perceived to be an interfering or neglectful mainland, um, but also in terms of what they are and what we are not. So a lot of our interviewees hold quite strong stereotypes um, of mainlanders as kind of fast food eating, chain store shopping, helpline calling incompetents um, who weren't at all like them as hardy, resilient islanders. Um, so Relating to identity, Brexit also comes to represent separation. Um, there's a great quote, not from one of our islands, but from a resident of Canvey Island um, in a paper by Philip Hayward, where he says that the residents would Brexit the mainland if they could. Um, Canvey Island residents voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. And whilst this was not our experience, there was a sense that government, governance, even at a county level, um, let alone national or transnational, did not have the best interests of islanders at heart. Um, and listening to my colleagues today, it's very, very true that this is apparent not just in a sort of onshore islands um, perspective, but also more broadly. So separation then would be a good thing in and of itself, um, allowing for a degree of independence. Um, although that's potentially more wishful thinking in our island's situation than is easily realisable. There's also something of a tension here, um, and I think everyone's alluded to this very much, that although island identity can be based on notions of antipathy to the mainland and on the ability to, um, to weather the storms of, of island living, um, the islands we looked at are actually very heavily subsidised by both local and national government. So it is true there are privations to island living around the, um, access to the island, services like water and electricity, schools, libraries, health and emergency services are all provided at cost to the national taxpayer um, rather to the specifically local one because of economies of scale not supporting um, the provision even of these statutory services. So the result of that is a degree of cognitive dissonance for residents who simultaneously benefit from the support of the mainland whilst also convincing themselves of their independence from it and their ability to weather the metaphorical storms of island living. So the challenge then of Brexit is whether this calls this island identity into question and therefore impacts on a really important coping mechanism that people have as islanders um, or whether it will also impact on the very concrete chain 
of subsidy which comes from national government um, by local government and um, to the islands. So kind of finally there's also a broader question about then the helpfulness of this sort of dichotomy. So the Brexit vote was essentially won through politics of division wasn't it? Um, and the creation of different categories of us and them perpetuated through ideas of islander and mainlander um, and vulnerability and resilience. So having inclusive local politics that address island needs on a par with mainland needs um, might go some way to addressing this without driving further division between mainland and island, um, remainers and leavers, UK and EU. And when we talk about plucky little islands, um, that's also very much the sort of identity, um, the, the sort of identity politics that the Leave campaign drew upon. So I think when we talk about um, island identity and the challenges posed by Brexit, looking at how small islands have navigated their relationship with the mainland um, and the scaling that up to how the EU, um, sorry, how the UK relates to Europe in itself can be of, of good use. Um, so it was a bit of a kind of whistle stop tour trying to get everything through. Um, I would very much, I have appreciated hearing other people's perspectives um, and I'm looking forward to hearing people's thoughts on that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so James, hopefully with your assistance, we can get everybody on camera uh, to answer some of the questions that are starting to come through. So if you uh, give me a nod, James, because I can't necessarily see who's being seen. So it's up to the person viewing on their side. They can select okay. speaker mode. Um, so as I'm seeing it, everyone is on screen. But if you're not seeing that, you can click in the top right corner. So there's a button called view. Thank you. Great, James. Thanks a lot. And James is helping me to try and uh, bring together the questions that have been uh, asked so far. I'll do my best to, to include all of them. If I do miss one or two, please uh, accept my apologies. But we'll try and get to everything in the next 50 minutes or so. So the first few questions I think are quite uh, general and applicable to all of uh, our speakers, really. There was quite an interesting bit of discussion in the, in the chat about the, the spending that will be lost as a con or has been lost as a consequence of Brexit and whether that will be replaced like for like by the British government. So Benito, you suggested that that's perhaps not going to be the case, but I was just wondering from your perspectives, uh, what you'd like to see in terms of UK government support going forward. Perhaps Benito, we can start with you. Thank you, Peter. Well, firstly, let's just understand uh, what the EU is currently funding. Uh, thematically, they are funding um, for uh, climate change, marine biodiversity, and sustainable energy. And the three of these areas are very key aspects of sustainable development. The programs that are in place now will come to an end uh, within a year or two. It's not going to be much longer um, before the end. It would be very useful and very helpful if the UK government could pick up the tab for the continuation of those programs because the funding the EU provided was not sufficient to, to do the complete uh, amount of work that's needed to build climate resilience, uh, to work on marine um, biodiversity con uh, 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 conservation and to uh, pursue sustainable energy initiatives. More funds are needed and I think what the UK can do is simply pour more money into those areas. But there's an important aspect of the funding that needs to be considered. The EU made those funds available to all overseas territories regardless of their income level. And this is unique because most overseas territories are not eligible for um, development assistance either because they are territories and non-sovereign or because of the, 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 many of them are high income. So if the UK does proceed to allocate uh, funds to replace those lost from the EU, the principle upon which the, the EU um, disbursed the funds should be maintained. Eligibility should be for all overseas territories. They are all small islands and coastal communities and all deserving of funds to support building their resilience overall. Thank you, Benita. Just before I move on to Andre, I guess one, one issue in terms of EU funding also is that it's, it's for a particular period. So it's secured for five years, for example, under the EDF. Uh, so would you be hoping for something like that also under the UK government? 
I, I hope so. The, the spending review is currently underway. And um, I do hope that consideration will be given uh, in this spending review, but also for budgets outward of two or three years, uh, where you know funding will be uh, earmarked to support the overseas territories in these areas. This is notwithstanding that more funding support is needed to address uh, health response with respect to COVID in the overseas territories, but we can't ignore the other issues because climate change is real and sustainable, sustainable development is key to building the resilience you need to have a sustainable society that can weather storms, degradation of the environment, and so on. Thank you, Billy Joe. Andre, your thoughts, please. I couldn't have said it better. I uh, second what Benito has said. I think that that's another one of those examples that I was referring to in my opening remarks of how you can actually give true meaning that we're actually a family, to step into the breach and fill these funding gaps and actually make these projects happen because they're not going to happen on their own. And Benito is quite right to point out many of the ways in which we could be, a certain OTs could be disqualified. So if we're truly a family and if we're truly going to tackle this together, this is one of the ways in which it could be done. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Teslin, any thoughts from you? Um, thank you. Uh, I think particularly for what we're trying to achieve in the Falklands, We've been able to look at some of those issues that Benito and Andre have described in a little bit more detail. So because of the setup that we have in terms of a limited population, we rely quite heavily on non-government organisations, certainly environmental ones, leaning in to help us set some of our policy direction. So they act as effectively scrutineers of what we do, and we have a really close collaborative working relationship that we've developed with our Environmental Research Institute, uh, as well as locally based other NGOs. Um, so some of the, the granular issues, um, I, I certainly agree that there needs to be uh, an elevation of funding through UK, um, through UK pots for environmental research. But as we've just seen, uh, the UK government have put, I think, a, a 10, million, um, 10 million into Darwin Plus, which was one of those environmental pots that overseas territories can dip into for biodiversity research. But part of the issue isn't having one pots that could potentially be unlimited. It is, as I think Benito has pointed to there, um, the criteria in which you can access it. But what importantly we do still lose is the ability to have multiple pots so that bids can be made across different funding streams so that they can complement each other, that you're not limited in a way by a quota of what you can take from, from the one pot that structures to support funding in a particular way. So best funding, which was access, access through the EU, for example, is best used to support long-term projects. Darwin Plus, you know, medium to short term. So how the funding structure um, can, be, can support these projects is important as well. And this is something we've been communicating to the UK government, but unfortunately doesn't seem to be <laughs> falling through. And we don't want it to be, um, and I certainly wouldn't accuse them of this, but. You don't want it to be just, a, oh, here's some money, you know, that's all your problems fix. It, 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 there's a little bit more detail um, behind it that, that needs to be worked out. As Benito and Andre have also described, not all territories such as ours are ODA eligible. So even in the UK system, we can't access um, the same funding pots as other overseas territories or, or other countries. But through the EDF 11, we were able to access money because of a loophole that exists for countries with, even though we are profitable per capita, we aren't um, a, a large scale uh, country. We've just got very few people and a good, a good and stable industry. Um, but it's about those future risks as well. And as we've seen with COVID, anything can throw everyone's plans into complete disarray. So we want to be able to have a meaningful relationship that includes collaborative dialogue and not certainly not colonial actions or anything like that, um, because it, it won't take islanders with, with what the UK government is trying to do. Um, and certainly on some of the work that, that Kate was describing there, um, obviously we're very different to uh, Crown dependencies and the relationship they have with the UK, but overseas territories are probably more Islander driven because we do support ourselves and we're very proud of that. Um, we support all of our own services and in certainly in Falkland's case, 
we just don't have an army to provide the defense that level that we need so and um, certainly in terms of that we're very grateful for the uk government for that support and that will be forever so some of those um little niches about how complex the relationship is with the uk they need to be better understood and not just kind of broad brushed thank you Tesla. Yeah. thank you thank you kate in terms of your research did you come up with and in terms of any uh views of the islanders about the level of financial support the mainland was providing i think I, there was an inevitable kind of tension between a lot of people feeling that more support was needed whilst also less interference um and people to an extent kind of wanting to have cake and eat it um i think there will be problems with with the end of eu funding in the way that everybody else has described in that whilst there will still be funding available it will be a smaller pot um, and i think there's a genuine problem of the way that people then or different communities will be forced to compete against one another um, when actually we should be looking more at collaborative working it really in any kind of walk of life um, having to compete for public funds i think is is problematic um, and particularly, I guess, without the kind of the recourse to the EU, the idea that potentially pitting um, the overseas territories then are also trying essentially competing with more onshore islands um, brings a different kind of level of problem to that. Um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know where the funding comes from in their community. Um, and I suspect at uh, uh, kind of national and regional, le regional levels, um, people also forget about, or legislators forget about the small islands that are part of their remit, whether they are onshore or offshore. So I think there's a lot to be gained from working together. Um, there are a lot of similarities, but yeah, I would definitely caution against the kind of competitive nature of funding. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm looking at the questions. I just want to turn briefly to, there are some questions uh, related to particular speakers. So there's one for you, Teslin, in terms of if WTO rules apply, uh, will the Falklands consider start exporting their calamari to other markets, especially some that may be closer geographically, for example, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and others, or even China? Okay, um, thank you, Peter. Uh, that, that is a very good question, and, and certainly one that we will always continue to look into. The problem is, um, it's how our industry has been built is around that EU relationship for the, for the first part. So those joint ventures are directly linked um, to Galicia and Spain. That is where our products are, are, are and the relationships, the, the market relationships that they've um, been able to build are all nicely um, established. In, in terms of international um, markets, we have a very specific an overhanging issue in that Argentina, which is a very large and influential country of 40 million people and a government with some very spiky policies towards the Falkland Islands, have imposed economic sanctions both formally and informally against us. So this, in the informal case, um, is lobbying South American countries to either not support us actively or certainly not engage in a conversation and certainly not one that would bring us any level of prosperity or support. We have been able to build useful links in terms of shipping with Uruguay and also with Chile in terms of our original um, flight link. Uh, we had a second commercial air link approved last year before the COVID-19 pandemic has, has closed off most tourism opportunities um, and that, that second commercial air link was with Sao Paulo. So I think certainly with UK support, and we would need a significant amount of it, perhaps some of that could be investigated. But again, the appetite for the, for the squid, that the calamari is very much in Europe. Um, you can, when you talk calamari rings, you think, you know, Southern Italy, Southern France, Spain, and, and that is where the demand for the large amount of exports that we have in that area is, is most and is most profitable. Uh, trying to replicate that elsewhere, like I say, it's logistically difficult and made even more so by the fact that Argentina creates laws to stop her, uh, stop and to pressurise businesses from, from trading with us. So having that very specific EU, UK single market access 
was, was so important for, for such a number of reasons, and it can't be easily replicated elsewhere. But this is certainly why the, the future free trade arrangements deals could be a potential interest. Thank you, Tesla, and thank you. A question for Andre. Uh, Andre, uh, what has surprised you most about your role? Or what is the one of the most unexpected aspects of your role as Cayman Islands representative to the UK slash Europe? Whoa. Okay. Now we're getting started. I would say, I had to put my finger on it. Within the first three months of coming into the role, so I started this role September 2019. And within the first few months, this is something that I knew intuitively as I, as I applied for the post, that one of the jobs of our office is to look after Caymanians overseas that are in the UK and Europe and in particular our students. So I always sort of knew that in the back of my mind. But what caught me off guard and maybe inspired me was to start to hang around with our Caymanian students as they were studying and learning that they were involved in all sorts of things that, and I, I don't consider myself aged yet, but that my generation wasn't even really thinking about. They were really about, it was like I could think of my crop of, of friends in uni in the UK, maybe about five or six disciplines that we were studying. But now, these Caymanian students are into neuroscience, artificial intelligence, sports science, data analytics, things that are just, and brain surgery and heart surgery, things that are just blowing my mind. So I suppose then the challenge for me then is having gotten that breath of fresh air of how bright the future can be. Because this whole panel, this, this entire conference, really what we're talking about is the future. And who are we trying to do this for then is the next generation. So I guess the challenge to my mind is to continue to build that sort of came out overseas community and ensure that those, that young brain power then somehow returns to Cayman for the maximum benefit of the country, or if they decide to stay overseas, still contribute in some sort of way to their home country. Thank you, Andre, thank you. Um, let's go back to a more general question. Uh, this one is about uh, links in a bit to what Benito said earlier about sort of regional cooperation and new regional links, and, and more generally too. How should the territory's relationship with the Commonwealth develop? Uh, OTs take part as nations in the Commonwealth Games, but not in the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which they can only do via the UK. Is there a case for a new relationship, or should the OTs relate more closely with other islands and SIDS and Oasis to seek access to Chogham and the UN SDGs processed through a community of islands? Um, perhaps, Andre, perhaps you could uh, begin with this one before I ask the other panelists. It is a, it's a very good question, and it's something that I've, I've quite um, thought about myself um, since I've been in the role to work with the Commonwealth, because these, as particularly for an OT that's in the Caribbean, a lot of the Commonwealth countries are in the Caribbean. And you do think to yourself, should we be having stronger bonds of relationships? We, we do get invited to some events and some parliamentary events and some games, but around the actual overall Commonwealth, I, I do think to myself whether or not there could be some scope for some sort of associate membership so you can work in partnership with your, your fellow, if at least for us, regional partners in the Caribbean. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Benito. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, First, let me tackle the Commonwealth uh, piece of this. The, there were two attempts made over the past decade to um, see if the Commonwealth could accept the OTs as associate members. And on both counts, it failed. Uh, the major players in the Commonwealth are not um, welcoming of that idea, and they believe it's appropriate for the overseas territories to remain observers and to be under the Commonwealth, within the Commonwealth, as a part of the UK. So that is the, the Commonwealth uh, uh, position at the moment. There, there is, of course, um, access with respect to, to various meetings that are, are helpful, sports ministers meetings, health ministers, and so on and so forth. But in terms of technical assistance and other support, we need to keep in mind 
that the Commonwealth does not have huge resources. The, the power of the Commonwealth is more so uh, about convening uh, the, the, the group of 50, 54 countries, I believe it is now, convening them to work on issues together, providing a forum. Um, then there are certain, of course, uh, policy approaches that they uh, recommend, and they do have a lot of work that they do uh, for small island developing states, which, makes up, uh, which make up a large number of their membership. Now, in terms of whether, how uh, overseas territories um, approach their groupings throughout the world, it's not, we are not homogeneous from that perspective. The, the, we, we have different treatment because of some of our uh, positions uh, geographically, and also because of the um, structure of our government. Some of us have ministerial governments, some of us do not, and some of us have challenges with territorial disputes. Now, in the Caribbean, we are privileged in that we are among Commonwealth states that are independent, and we have engaged with them for a long time. It's partly historical. And because of that historical relationship and the constitutional advancement of Anguilla, uh, BVI, Cayman, Turks and Caicos, Montserrat, and Bermuda, more so in the North Atlantic, we have ministerial government where the premier or the chief minister is essentially the head of government and can represent uh, their territories in regional organizations such as CARICOM and OECS. Uh, there are six overseas territories that are associate members of CARICOM already, three that are associate members of um, the OECS. We have three now that are also members of the Association of Caribbean States. And currently, uh, most are uh, observers at CARIFORUM, which is the regional grouping for negotiations with the EU. So we in the Caribbean are part of all of these things. So we have ample opportunity to engage in partnership uh, with our regional neighbors through these organizations. Let me just mention uh, BVI's approach uh, quickly, Peter. We are trying to rebalance the loss of the EU as an international partner with the UN. And we are very fortunate that we are, an we are an associate member of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, which gives us very good access to the United Nations. And uh, they have been really helping us uh, uh, over the years. It's been increasing, improving, and now they are really stepping up to support us on addressing um, uh, COVID-19 and our health response. So the, the, the situation is not the same for all overseas territories, but those in the Caribbean seem to have the big advantage. And the question is, Peter, what do those in the South Atlantic do, uh, the Pacific, Pitcairn, what do they do when they lose their EU, EU relationship? Who do they make up uh, uh, the relationship with? Is there another block that they can join in the Pacific? or, or um, off of Africa. So that's an important question, but I would leave it for others to answer that. Thank you, Benita. And that's a nice segue into Teslin, possibly. Yes, absolutely perfect. Uh, thank you, Benito. We're also one of those examples of a, a non-ministerial uh, government that does have a geopolitical uh, headache in a, a, a claim to our sovereignty as well. Um, but he, he points to a very interesting point, um, which we also discovered as a result of the UK leaving the EU, which is that the UK is withdrawing as a signature to, to the Lisbon Treaty. And under that treaty, there was a um, responsibility of all EU members to sign up to the principle of self-determination and respect that, um, which was then obviously extended to, a, to all UK citizens um, under that ratification. Um, withdrawing from that agreement, um, you could say um, it could leave us more vulnerable to people not being vocally supportive of our right to self-determination. And there is possibly a need then to, for the UK government to do more active lobbying on all, all UK citizens being able to enjoy that fundamental human right, um, which is protected under the UN Charter. Um, so. That was one of those potential risks. Obviously, you hope that, you know, internationally reputable countries such as France, Germany, Spain, 
Portugal, Greece will not um, change their stance on human rights anytime soon. But um, there is possibly potential that they become a bit more susceptible to um, not paying particular attention to the Falkland Islands issue if, um, as there is no requirement for them to do so. So moving on to the Commonwealth relationship, uh, earlier this year, actually about a week before the COVID-19 uh, international flight restrictions really started hitting hard, um, we invited guests from across the British Islands Mediterranean region uh, of the Commonwealth um, for a Commonwealth Women's Parliamentary Conference, which was the first um, such conference of the UK that the Falklands had ever hosted here. And it was, it was well supported through, through the BIMR region for which we are, we are, de are designated as. Even though we're in the South Atlantic, we, we count as a British Island Mediterranean region, which is, you know, good to know. Um, but, you know, there is a good network there and we have been tapping into it and we have been able to uh, progress and build upon some of the work that they have achieved and do knowledge sharing, see what's happening in Cyprus, what challenges do they have in Malta, find common themes that we can then assist and highlight um, through, through our population. But there is more to be done. Another organisation we have looked at in the past was um, Small Islands Developing States, so SIDS, uh, as it's more commonly known. Um, we didn't quite feel it was appropriate at the time, as technically we are a developed island, but certainly we are, we are small enough to be considered um, more vulnerable than others to, to fluctuations, certainly seasonal variability affecting our markets, etc. And we have seen in the past um, recessions in the Falklands, which have been linked to seasonal variability in particular. So climate change continues to be incredibly important and certainly as a spokes centre for that, um, it will be interesting to see how the UK develops its Commonwealth links and Commonwealth relationships to highlight on some of these more important issues, because we would like to knowledge share in certainly in some of those areas. And the idea of a South Atlantic network is an interesting one, um, we do have an environmental research institute, which was started by the government here, um, but has now become fully independent, which links up the South Atlantic. And I think they were presenting earlier in the week um, in some of these island summits. Um, it's an organization called SARI, um, which has started that territory to territory link in the South Atlantic in particular, uh, and also been doing a lot of work with Montserrat up in the Caribbean too. But there has been, some, there is more potential there, I think, but in terms of our very specific interests, it can be difficult to get that kind of support. Thank you, Tesla. Kate, just briefly, in your research, did you get a sense of the islands you spoke to of a sort of a community of British islands at all? Um, it's been interesting listening to, to people talking about the Commonwealth um, and these kind of different levels of governance and thinking how I could start to address this without being too specific about the governance of the islands that we researched, which would then give away essentially which islands they are. Um, but certainly I think that there was a feeling of a kind of commonality across islands. People work and travel between different islands um, and participate in things kind of as islanders. Um, looking perhaps not quite to the scale of the Commonwealth Games, but certainly the Island Games, which I know, Peter, you were at in Gibraltar last year, were you not? Um, islands that we've studied have participated in that. So th there is a kind of a perception of themselves as part of a greater community of islands beyond the UK. Um, but because they are broadly covered with kind of local governance structures closer to home, um, it doesn't necessarily kind of extend into the, the kind of realm of international or transnational governance. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the last couple of days, there's quite a lot of fanfare with the uh, Japan-UK free trade agreement. And this is a question, uh, will the new free trade agreements to be negotiated by the UK after Brexit impact the economies of the overseas territories? Perhaps, um, Tesla, we can start with you on this one. Um, yeah, so this is a, a specific arrangement um, that I, I would say is, is potentially of interest and certainly you'd hope FTAs in general will have a positive impact upon economies. Uh, the only way in which it can, that can happen, I suppose, is if we're not 
subject to all of the same regulations. So there would be a need for derogations to be uh, agreed. And I think as we described earlier in this talk, um, having a meaningful discussion, particularly with the Department for International Trade, so that a framework of, or, or an understanding of, of what overseas territories can actually deliver and provide um, before establishing um, the FTA framework is more meaningful. So for instance, we all know that the Falkland Islands is logistically challenged. We are um, two very small islands with three and a half thousand people at the bottom of the South Atlantic. And there are very few pathways um, compared to other international countries in which to access the islands. So you've got a limited labor pool, for instance, even though we can set up a strong regulatory framework, we can look at the conventions that we need to, to, to bolster. We've certainly been doing that in our maritime sector. Um, there is, there needs to be some kind of recognition that we may not be able to, to fulfill all of the demands of an FTA. So to trade into um, Japan as an example, um, there may be a requirement that the UK and Japan have made an agreement of that we can't physically uh, uh, fulfill. Um, so there needs to be a bit of understanding there. But like I say, a meaningful understanding, a mean of meaningful conversation beforehand should hopefully give the UK um, a good way to mitigate some of that. But it, it, again, it comes back to this point on collaboration. We need to be able to talk directly to UK departments to get this across and have it respected and understood by both ministers and the departments. Thanks, Teslin. Uh, Benito. Yes, Peter. <clears throat> Thank you. I, firstly, the UK, you know, should of course strive to get as many of these uh, agreements as possible. Japan is a good, a good opportunity um, to have free trade with them, and the offer for overseas territories to be included in these uh, free trade arrangements or trade agreements um, at their request is a positive thing. <clears throat> but it's a bit more nuanced than that. The 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 question of whether an overseas territory decides to participate in a UK free trade agreement really is about whether or not they have something to sell into that market. And when you look at the big picture, um, in, at the big picture in terms of trade for overseas territories, it's it's a bit mixed. So as Teslin said, you know, the Falklands exports fishery exports um, a, a great deal of fisheries products. Uh, Tristan de Kuna similarly and potentially um, uh, others. But there are other overseas territories who their primary um, trade is in trade in services, financial services, for example, in the Caribbean. And even when it, where it comes to commodities, their primary market in the, Car uh, in the Caribbean is the United States and Canada. So uh, there are already trade arrangements in place through the Caribbean Basin, Caribbean Basin Initiative for the Caribbean-based uh, territories. The, I, I do think that um, when a place like St. Helena begins to ramp up its economy further, uh, or Tristan de Kuna, if it's ever repopulated fully and there's industry there, there needs to be, a co of course, a look at which um, agreements the UK will be trying to establish, uh, trade agreements they'll be trying to establish in, those, in that part of the world or those parts of the world and whether or not it makes sense to include um, the, 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 the respective territories or offer to include them in those uh, trade, trade agreements based on whether or not they actually have something real to sell into. Uh, we, this isn't an exercise and let's just do it just because it's a, it sounds good, it feels good. This is, has to be the, uh, dealt with on a, very on a very technical basis and I am very sympathetic uh, actually to, to Falklands because this is very real for them. What's happening with Brexit is very real and they need markets to sell into. And I hope the UK really uh, gives them the support that they require uh, should they want to join any of these free trade agreements. Thanks, Benito. Andre. I don't think I can add much more to, to that topic than Teslin and Benito already has well covered it. I thought maybe what I could do then is to throw out maybe a slightly nuanced among the panelists because we touched on FTAs and we've touched on the Commonwealth. 
But I wonder just to maybe highlight for the audience who may not be aware that we as OTs have a UK Overseas Territories Association. And I wanted to just get a, a, a feeling, I don't have a, a formalized answer to this, this is an honest question, of how we feel that association is working and is there more that we could do amongst ourselves, cross OT, um, as we begin to bring that sort of global UK family link that I talked about. So just an open question for the panel. Maybe back to Benito briefly and then to Tesla. I'm sorry, just repeat it one more time for me, Andre. So we, as you know, we have a UK Overseas Territories Association. And in your prior role as rep, you would have sat around the tables for that, for those meetings. And I just wonder whether or not within the confines of that association, if you think, or Teslin, think that there's maybe more that we can do together. Is there anything that you think that could be elevated within the association to look after each other a bit more? We talked about the Commonwealth, we talked about FTAs, but I'm just curious if, if, if there are thoughts around the panel of there's more that we could do together as OTs. Okay, sure. Um, and I'm very happy to, to share my thoughts. One of the big issues that came up um, during our initial discussions on the impact of the sectoral impact of Brexit on the overseas territories uh, was the, the actual administrative capacity and technical competency of overseas territories to engage in dialogue on trade and other issues. And what we found was, was that there were some territories that had much more experience than others in dealing with, with certain issues. So for example, again, Falklands, was much more experienced in, in trade um, with, uh, and fisheries products than the rest of us and was able to actually speak very competently on what they think should happen in terms of UK support uh, uh, given the Brexit dynamics. So one of the things that we really need to do is lean more on each other's competency in, in engaging with the UK and other partners on key issues. And we're talking about Brexit today, so I'll, 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 I'll uh, deal with that. One of the big opportunities that we have is, and Cayman, can, and Cayman took advantage of this re, um, two years ago, is that the UK is going to have trade missions that it, it embarks on to kind of see what, you know, get a read of the temperature in, in other countries to see if there, there are markets there. And they've offered for overseas territories to participate in that process. And sometimes, you know, some overseas, overseas territories may not be fully prepared to make the trip to, 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 to um, promote their products to their market. But we should think about whether or not one territory or two, if they actually get a spot in a UK mission, trade mission, can represent a, a wider number of territories beyond themselves, just their, their own. Uh, that would go a long way, I believe, to help for, to us working together and getting more economic benefits from a collective perspective. I mean, I think, uh, at least I can say BVI would welcome that um, uh, kind of cooperation if colleagues uh, agreed to it. Thanks, for Benito. Thank you, there, Peter. Um, but I, I'm happy to address what, what Benito said there, because I think he, he's, he's drawn to some very specific points, which I was going to mention. So I've been reading my notes, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, uh, I'd just like to say, yeah, no, I completely agree. The UCOTA network is, is I've only been um, in this role a couple of years, but as the representative who attends those UCOTA meetings, and I've had the great pleasure of hosting one um, back in, in 2018, there was, um, there is more opportunity, I think, there certainly that we can be doing together. And certainly what Benita was saying in terms of technical capacity, it's, it's something we, we would like to explore because, um, certainly the networks that um, the Caribbean OTs have, have managed to, to, to build and the strength in diplomacy, certainly that you've been able to, to, to rally towards is something that also we need to learn. We've become, I think, a bit too sectoral focused in some areas and we do still need to think about our position in the world, um, certainly probably more than many other places. And kind of Brexit has put a, a magnifying glass upon some of this issue. And certainly at the trade summit that the Cayman Islands had hosted back in, in, in 2018, I think it was now, or 20, 2019, 
the years are running by, um, <laughs> the Department for International Trade and um, UK Export Finance came and gave um, very useful talks. And uh, it's those kind of network opportunities, I think, as, as a lobbying association that, that we can be making more of. Um, when it came to outlining even our, our Brexit concerns, that was something we decided to do um, to put a report together, put it all in one place, and then have that as a lobbying document for the UK government as well. So we are kind of stronger together, um, and we certainly can make those links a lot stronger. I think certainly we need to work on that approach and acknowledging there is a, a pre-JMC and a JMC coming up later in this year as a joint ministerial council for, for, for some of the observers who may not be familiar. Um, that's a formal opportunity for the whole association, the whole grouping of OTs to be able to talk directly to UK departments and UK ministers. And some of these very particular issues need to be brought up. Brexit's been there for a while, but now we need to look to the future. We need to think about the modern relationship and free trade arrangements and how we can get a meaningful link in. Um, but yeah, very good point, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Tesla. Andre, do you want to come back at all or shall we move on? No, I'll just say very briefly that I, I'm heartened to hear the comments from Benito and Tesla. And I, those are very, very helpful. And I think we do need to develop those links. Great. Thank you. Just to say, everyone, that we're into the last 15 minutes and there are a few questions still to get through if we can. We'll try and get through uh, all of if we can possibly do that. So perhaps in the last 15 minutes, it's a slightly more rapid fire uh, Q&A experience. So we can hopefully cover everything that we possibly can. Um, so. It's a good time to lose my place. Uh, one question is about uh, links with maybe the French and the Dutch territories within the Caribbean and what potential there is for stronger links with those territories. Uh, maybe Andre, we can start with you and then Benito. Well, this is one of the, I think, I think my fellow panelists would agree, is one of the consequences of Brexit is that we had an overseas um, countries and territories association called OCTA, in which we were all a family. So the French, the Dutch territories, UK and, and the Danish. And the, I, I suppose this is the appropriate analogy to use because the parents are getting a divorce, the, the kids are being split up. So we, we sort of answer your question, we had that. Um, now, we're trying to work out how that's going, how the kids are going to cooperate with each other post the divorce. So that conversation is ongoing now in terms of how we can work together and whether there's some sort of informal memorandum of understanding where we can at least still share insights and, and analysis and collaborate. Um, but it, it is one of the, I think, unforeseen consequences of, of Brexit. And I remember attending one of the last OCTA meetings in Brussels, and it was quite a sad affair uh, to see folks around the table who had accomplished much. I was new at the time, but to see folks who had been working together for over 10 years, it, it, it really it did really pull at the heartstrings. Thank you, Andre. Benito. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Peter. The, the situation um, uh, is currently that Brexit is going to kind of nullify some of the areas of cooperation that we have with uh, British, between the British, Dutch, uh, French, and Danish uh, overseas territories. We, we, used, we would meet annually um, for the OCT uh, OCTA Ministerial Conference, as well as the, the annual EU Forum. Uh, a, a large part of the relationship was about cooperating on regional projects and uh, OCT projects. We have to rethink at the wider level of the 22 overseas countries and territories that are Dutch, French, British, and Danish on how we cooperate. The British overseas territories, the relationship with the EU does not end. It will diminish, but it does not end. It, it will change form. So we need to continue efforts such as lobbying in the European Parliament on issues such as climate change and sustained biodiversity, sustainable development. The EU is a big player in these areas. And so my suggestion, my recommendation is that what these territories do, the British and the others, is stick together and continue, continue to work together and lobby 
which provides greater influence where we can in places like the European Parliament. So that's one side of it. On the Caribbean, uh, in the Caribbean specifically, Peter, the, the territories had established um, the Caribbean Overseas Countries and Territories Council several years ago, comprised of all of the respective uh, groupings of Caribbean territories, except for the US, uh, US ones. And that worked reasonably well. Um, there could be an attempt to revive it, I don't know. But what we do have is uh, the Caribbean Development and Cooperation Committee under ICLAC, where there are 15 associate members that include all of the French, all of the Dutch, all of the, uh, the, the US territories, and all, and all of the British Caribbean territories. And in that framework, we can cooperate. And let me just mention lastly, there is going to be a summit of the associate members, the 15 associate members of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean in 2021 to discuss the 2030 development agenda and how to achieve the sustainable development goals. So the UN is doing a great deal of work in supporting the territories, the, the overseas territories in the Caribbean across all their groupings, which will provide a platform for greater cooperation. Thank you, Benito. Thanks a lot. Uh, Tenzlin, a question for you. Uh, do you think uh, coronavirus and Brexit can create op opportunities to improve relations with Argentina? Um, certainly, certainly not. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, you'd always love to have uh, kind of a feeling in the back of your heart that maybe some of these issues can can be resolved. Unfortunately, Argentina has written it into its constitution that it's going to continue to actively um, and aggressively <laughs> try to take back, in, as they see it, um, the Falkland Islands. And uh, for people who are, are listening, who may not know uh, a lot about our history, and, and certainly there are probably very few people who do beyond 1982, um, the Falkland Islands have only ever had one population, uh, of which I am a, a seventh generation Falkland Islander. And I think by pure virtue of being close ish, you know, 400, 500 miles um, from, from Argentina. Uh, they, in the last 50, uh, since, well, since the Ruler Statement in 1950, decided they were going to make active and um, antagonistic uh, sovereignty claims on, on the Falklands because of a presence that they maintained um, for about a year in 1833. So the Falklands had been British before that, been very, very, very British since, and um, we continue to be a incredibly inclusive and multinational society. But we are Falkland Islanders, and that is a, a, a problem for Argentina. So that's the kind of bit of the, the background. Um, since then, they've written it into their constitution, and most recently, they've formed a committee to look at uh, aggress uh, again aggressive policy. Uh, in ways that they can enhance economic sanctions against us. So, for instance, they block our airspace. Um, they uh, come up with uh, letters of discomfort, which they send to industries who are looking to exploit in our maritime zone, for example. And they threaten to arrest people who are involved in the economy of the Falklands as well. So it's, it's not a small thing, unfortunately, that we can look past. And actually, as part of COVID-19, they started declaring cases of, of coronavirus in the Falklands as their own, which was just a bit odd, if you, if you ask me. Um, we, we have had about, we've had 13 active cases. Um, we've since spent um, months clear of COVID-19 due to very reactive, very swift um, government policy that me and my colleagues have, have enacted. Um, we're very proud of that, um, but certainly all the effort has been our own with a lot of help from the UK government. And again, we, we remain incredibly uh, supportive of that. But no, I, I, I shouldn't think there is any opportunity for such. Thank you, Tesla. Uh, a question for, for, for you all, I think, is about uh, local entrepreneurship. Are government supporting local entrepreneurs as well as open to bring problem solvers from outside of the islands? Isn't it time to rethink the way we govern? Perhaps Teslin, uh, as you're on the screen, you can start with that one. Okay, um, yeah, um, I think we, we describe it locally as, as churn, I guess. Um, 
we have three and a half thousand people and certainly not enough people to do all, all the jobs um, that we have. We have a legislative government. Uh, we don't have a ministerial one. Um, we are democratically elected by the people, which is important. And our system of government uh, highlights the need for two constituencies, which is five who are Stanley based in town and three that represent about 99% of the islands, which I'm one, which is called CAMP. Uh, the balance works well. Um, there is, I think, and my colleagues have also described this in their, in their um, respective territories as well, sometimes the points of tension with the UK government when it comes to certainly constitutional responsibilities. And even though, and I think it comes, some of it can, as Kay says, it, it comes down to communication and how you can express that, that vision to the UK government in a way that they can appreciate and understand. I'm sorry if I lost a bit of the context of, of what you were describing. I, I apologise, I should have said I, I picked up the end of, of your question. Uh, I hope I've at least given a start for my colleagues to address. Sure, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, over to Kate, perhaps. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about this in terms of um, the islands that we've looked at and thinking there are kind of two different ways in which um, the governments that or the governance that um, promote kind of entrepreneurship and one is a kind of off island offer so encouraging people who are based on the islands to be kind of digital entrepreneurs for example running businesses that may be have a mainland or a global reach um, from the islands um, and I think if anything if there are any positives coming out of COVID it's the ability for people to be able to see that these kind of things are possible you can work a lot more remotely um, but to have then the capital coming back into the island community I think is important um, I think the other problem with entrepreneurship or a kind of counter problem um, is that in these small tourist or agriculture based islands the entrepreneurship is often essentially not quite subsistence but it's the lower wage kind of end so yes people are running small businesses um, but it's in more kind of um, kind of tourist production. Um, one area that I do think is being promoted um, really successfully, it's a really good story, um, is around a, having a local food offer and developing kind of keying in, in with um, the kind of the eating and shopping local kind of thoughts that people have, um, the sort of an there is a sustainability aspect to it but it's sort of derived from a sort of local food tourism offer so that's allowing some local entrepreneurs to kind of develop a more kind of stylish food offer that has both kind of a high-end reach but also roots in a kind of sustainable production um, and seeing how the local governance um, setup is promoting that I think has been really positive. Thank you Kate. Uh, Andre? Well, since we're in the speed round, I'll just answer very quickly and say, yes, Cayman's open to that. We have examples of it that it's ongoing now, subject to local company controls. So yes, Cayman's very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and already has some classic examples in which we have partnered with not just local businesses, but then also foreign expertise. Thank you. And Benito. Uh, Peter, I'm, I'm going to buck your question. Um, Yes, we like entrepreneurship. If other outsiders are needed, sure. But what I really want to say to the public, uh, the, the audience that's listening, is that Peter Clegg, Dr. Peter Clegg, is the foremost academic expert and authority on overseas territories, British overseas territories. And he is the one that did the groundbreaking work uh, in terms of the reports that helped to guide the overseas territories, territories and understanding the impact of Brexit on them. If you want more information on this, please go online and look up Peter's work and his papers, particularly the ones on uh, the impact of Brexit, Brexit on the OTs, is available at the University of West of England. And I'm sure if you send him an email, he can point you in the right direction. I, it would have been remiss of me to not say that, Peter, and I loved working with you on all of those topics and issues. Thank you, Benito, and that's probably a great uh, point to, to end this session, actually. But, uh, 
I just have to say that I do apologize. There are a few questions that we weren't able to get to. Kate, there were a couple about uh, your approach to the research and your research methodology, which hopefully can be picked up afterwards. There was also about the sort of the constitutional future uh, between the United Kingdom and the overseas territories, which is a crucial one. And again, we haven't quite got time to deal with. But I just wanted to say thank you so much to Benito, to Andre, and to Teslin and to Kate, to thank you all for your comments and for your chat and for your questions. And perhaps just leave you with a quote from Boris Johnson that he gave for Gibraltar's National Day message. He talked of the exciting post-Brexit future filled with glittering opportunities and it will be an enormous success. Of course, time will tell. I just hope that this will not be another occasion when rhetoric distracts from reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Nice to see you, Ron. Thank, Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.